Hi, my name is Leon Rowe, currency trader and trading coach at trading180.com. And in this video, I'm going to talk about why you should consider trading ranges and not trends. And I understand um, the usual uh, paradigm that people are actually currently in. The trend is your friend and it's been repeated, um, you know, over and over again. You should, you know, wait for the trend, higher highs, higher lows, lower highs, lower lows. But I'm going to really kind of shift that paradigm into and hopefully make a compelling case as to why you should think about trading ranges and not trends. And what I'm going to be covering um, in this presentation and in this video is going to be uh, fair value auctions. What are they? Um, um, what the market consists of, fair value auctions, FVAs, uh, come in different sizes and time horizons, institutional big business FVAs, and it takes them, you know, business, big businesses uh, time to um, do business due to market illiquidity and iceberg orders, and I'll explain those, as well as uh, small FVAs within big FVAs and trends within FVAs. So a lot to go through in this video. Hope you stay tuned. Um, so Let's get into trade ranges, not trends, right? So fair value auctions, what are they? And basically, fair value auctions are um, are ranges, right? They are ranges. Now, a range is known, you know, uh, to everybody uh, to look like this on a price chart where prices are not basically trending, right? It's just, uh, you know, prices are within a, a certain high and a certain low. Now, it's important really to understand that, um, you know, to call whatever it is you're interacting with by its uh, its pretty its proper name and what it is right and uh, these concepts that i'm going to be talking about uh with regards to fair value auctions are, are really from um uh, mark chapman who's a friend of mine and please check out his uh, underground traders alliance uh, youtube channel uh, fantastic fantastic high level the highest level information you will get on youtube about um you know the, these types of concepts and trading in general right it's not you know your typical uh, Elliott wave or wyckoff stuff this you know his market makers business model is um is absolutely the the highest level of analysis that you can get and i'm not going to get into necessarily market makers in this video uh or, or at all really but um there was obviously elements of of market making that come into this but um one of the things that mark says is that um you know uh, if you don't uh, call um, the uh, the thing that you're interacting with by its proper name, then uh, you're not going to interact with it in the way that you should. So what I mean by that is, you know, and his analogy is also is if you, uh, you know, treat a dog uh, like not like a dog, but like a chicken, then you're not treating it like a dog. Right. And you're going to basically mistreat that dog because you're treating it like a chicken. You have to recognize a dog for what it is. It is a dog. Right. And you've got to treat it as such. If you're, you know, trading, you know, the Forex markets or any market, for example, yeah, any asset class, if you don't understand what and how to interact and what is really going on, then you're always going to be on the wrong side of the market, right? You might be on the right side, you know, here and there. And of course, you might get big wins, small wins, big losses, small losses, right? That's going to happen. That's just the nature of the randomness of the market. But ultimately, you're always going to be at a disadvantage. Therefore, um, you know, the statistics are still the same in terms of, you know, what is it 80, 90 percent of traders don't make money. And, you know, the ones that uh, are not in that statistic, the vast majority of them just break even over time. Right. And one of the reasons is because if you're not if you're not understanding what you're interacting with, you know, to the fullest extent, then. Um, you're not going to interact with it in the way that you should. And so what is a, really a market and what does a market consist of? A market consists of, you know, buyers and sellers. We always talk about the market, you know, the market is bullish, the market is bearish, right? But what are we actually really saying is that, you know, uh, buyers, basically, the market consists of buyers and sellers and they are um, constantly doing business and uh, around what they think are uh, cheap, uh, expensive, and fair value, uh, um, you know, prices for that particular uh, asset at that particular point in time, right? So the market is really just an auction of buyers and sellers, right? Um, sometimes you can, you know, you go to an auction and you might see something that is undervalued. You're obviously going to get a floor price, and buyers will think that is cheap. But then you'll get a, a, a time in the auction where um, you know the auctioneer is going to say, "Is anyone going to go higher than this price?" And then people are going to go, no, "No, because it's too expensive, right?" And that's basically what 
a, a, a range actually is, or and, and, and what is known as a fair value auction, right? Where you have buyers and sellers, yeah, have agreed that you know this is pretty much expensive, yeah, for, from a buying perspective, and this is cheap or what is known as a bargain price, yeah. We know that to be absolute fact because buyers came in and drove the price higher, right? And this is where sellers. You know, were wanted to definitely, you know, get out and sell the market, right? So that applies to any market. Again, whether it's forex, whether it's gold, whether it's stocks, whether it's the housing market, you know, it doesn't matter. There is usually a uh, what is known as a range, or you know, in 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 the retail space, but actually, in fact, it should be known as now a fair value auction. Yeah. And that is what you're interacting with, yeah? And it's our mission as traders, yeah, to trade and do business ultimately at areas, right, where we think there are bargains or expensive. That's it, yeah? That's our, um, our, our mission as traders to do business around those areas, yeah? Our business is not to try to predict, you know, certain uh, trends, although, of course, I'll get into that in a sec. It's if you can, you know, have the foundation as to understand where bargain prices are, where expensive prices are, that is the starting point, or that should be your starting point, because that's where you understand that business, the majority of business is being done, right? And so, with that being said, on to the next slide. Uh, you know, fair value auctions, yeah, come in different sizes and time horizons. We know this instinctively. If you look at a price chart, you can go down to the one minute and see, you know, uh, and look at, you know, uh, uh, price, you know, uh, go into some sort of fair value auction, right, on a one minute chart. Yeah, you can see it go into it and, and, and last for maybe, you know, um, a few minutes to a few hours or so, right? Or you can go up to the daily time frame uh, chart and see that, you know, fair value auctions, you know, uh, are lasting for days, weeks, and even months, right? And institutional, you know, big businesses, right? They do business typically, right? Uh, fair value auctions um, over, you know, 200 to 600 pips on average, right? Um, depending on obviously the currency pair and uh, the volatility at the time, right? Because fundamentally and resentment wise, there could be things going on that drives volatility higher or lower. But typically what you'll see, and especially if you are if you go to, um, uh, you know, certain bank forecasts, um, you'll see a lot of the ones that we use at Trading 180, you'll see they actually publish what they still consider as ranges, but they'll, cons they'll, they'll say, for example, the euro dollar is in, uh, they think that the euro dollar would be in a, in a particular range over the next month right or a particular auction as we know they'll say you know maybe the um in the month of uh, or for the first quarter they think the high of the range will be you know 110s for example and then the uh the, the low might be for example the 105s right which is basically would be like a 500 pip uh, auction and they'll say that they'll openly say that in in these publications and so the the financial institutions the big business Right, are telling us, yeah, that that is um, what uh, they are expecting, right? As far as an auction and where to do business. And again, what we want to do is, if you know, they're telling us that this is actually considered a bargain and that might be considered expensive, depending on whether you're buying the base or the quote currency. Now, um, you know, businesses. Not all businesses do um, business at, you know. Uh, at every level, right? There are some businesses where um, banks and institutions that won't do business at a lot of uh, different price points because they consider that to be, you know, either expensive or they're just not interested in in, in doing business at those prices. But there are, um, and nobody really knows to the extent of exactly where prices will exactly reverse, right? It's, you know, it's, it's like trying to, you know, uh, uh, predict where, you know, uh, 10,000 fish are likely to swim in which direction, right? You, every, everybody has got a different valuation of what they think is expensive and what they think is cheap. But 
um, the consensus normally, there's normally a consensus, right? There is normally a consensus when it comes to uh, auctions, and this is obviously due to fundamental analysis, which I'll probably touch on maybe a bit later, right? Now, it takes time for biz big business to do business, right? And so when we're looking at this from, a, from for example, a, a higher time frame chart, which I always suggest that you do start off as a, as a as from an absolute minimum perspective from a daily and if you want to work your way down fine it's up to you but from a daily or a weekly time frame uh, chart um, because that's what institutions do they look at the, the bigger picture and they have to do business it takes time for institutions to do big business yeah and so hence the reason for the you know 200 to 600 pip um, fair value uh, uh, auction sizes right and the reason why that is is because of you know the market is highly illiquid right and so what do i mean by that now let's say for example you have a bank who wants to um who wants to do business right who wants to buy uh let's say for example we want to buy euros right and they want to place a one billion order right so let's just call it you know bank a yeah bank a they want to uh you know place a one billion pound order and buy one billion pounds worth of euros against the dollar yeah now what you're going to find is that um there needs to be if they want to buy there needs to be at least at an absolute bare minimum right there needs to be at least one billion pounds worth of sell orders right sell orders needs to you know to facilitate all that buying at a particular price yeah because if this is obviously price and this would be time yeah they want to do business probably somewhere around here right the lows right whatever that price whatever that price is yeah so they need at least 1 billion uh, sell orders yeah to facilitate their 1 billion buy orders but guess what they're not the only, you know, bank in town that are, you know, fundamentally the thinking that they want to be, a, you know, buyers of, of the euro because, for example, maybe the euro are still hiking rates and maybe the Federal Reserve are coming to an end, right, of their hiking cycle and hiking typically does appreciate a currency. And so what you have to understand is that because they're not the only bank in town, um, you know, even though there might be one billion pounds worth of sell orders at a certain area there's other businesses doing business down here for maybe other reasons maybe speculation uh and 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 you know the like now if you know the bank a want to you know get involved in that and there's not enough liquidity let's say or let's say for example there is there's there's, there's one billion pounds worth of sell orders here maybe again the average uh daily um orders that come into the market are maybe somewhere around the 50 million right 50 million uh, uh, uh you know order size right and this is where iceberg orders comes in and what iceberg orders really are are basically just breaking down um the one billion pound order into smaller orders you know 20 million pound here you know maybe 30 million pound here right until it all adds up to one billion so what the banks are trying to do by basically breaking down their one billion pound order if the average order size you know on a particular day is 50 if it's 50 million and they place a one billion pound order then you know this it's going to basically spook the market it's going to tip the market off as to why is this big entity bank a looking to you know place a one billion pound order and also as well filling those orders does take time and so you know there's algorithms competing with each other to fill orders etc and so they might not actually get filled at that particular price all their one billion right by the next order up the next order up because they've got sell orders right and this is what's known as avoid this is what's known as slippage right where banks are really trying to avoid slippage and that's the whole point in iceberg orders is that when they get filled they want to get filled at the at a good price by the time maybe you know maybe i don't know 500 million you know uh pounds worth of their order gets filled everyone else is rushed into the market and then it drives prices higher and then the next 500 million pounds of that one billion pound order might get filled in various degrees a lot higher when really ultimately they wanted to you know do business at these areas here right so they're trying not to tip the market off try not to you know get everyone else in at the same time and if bank a also wants to 
you know, do business and thinks that the euro is going to go higher, you can, you know, bet with, uh, you know, uh, like night follows day as certain as that, that um, other banks, Bank B, Bank C, Bank E, Bank F, all these banks, right, are also thinking the same thing. They want to be long on the euro, right? And so, you know, getting not necessarily getting into market makers, but understand that the market maker's job is to provide liquidity for the banks and they can't do it all at once. It's impossible. Right? They need to provide the liquidity. They need to buy the buy orders and the sell orders because remember, not everyone wants to be a buyer. There are going to be sellers as well. And so there are multiple market makers, multiple orders. You can see how complex this gets, right? But ultimately, it takes time for the financial institutions to do business. Yeah. And so that's the reason why you see, you know, pullbacks, right? The pullbacks occur. Um, Actually, I can't get into the exact reason, but just know that market makers, right, um, you know, are, are in the market, you know, buyers and sellers are in the market and you have pullbacks, right, in the market. And so it gives opportunities for, um, you know, big businesses to do business over a certain period of time. And sometimes this can be this could be one week. This could be even one month. Right. And so it takes time, as I said, for big business to do do business yeah and that's due to market illiquidity and iceberg orders in the market just as you know just just so you know is that the market is highly illiquid right it's highly illiquid and so if you understand this if you can understand this it's brilliant because then it gives you an insight as to how the market is really working yeah and so with that being said um, that's the reason why you get these, you know, big fair value auctions, you know, 200 to 600 pip uh, auctions in size, as well as the reasons why, you know, you have auctions and big auctions that can last for weeks and even several months. And I'm going to go into an example uh, on a chart in a sec. But before I do, um, you also need to understand that, you know, there are small uh, fair value auctions within big fair value auctions, right? Because you have, again, from, you know, institutions, if you, you know, look at CLT reports, you have asset managers, you have leverage funds, etc. They all have different motives uh, in order to, you know, get involved in why they're buying and selling. Yeah, some for speculation, some for, you know, the pension funds are probably looking at more long term, uh, you know, more of a nine to 12 to 18 month time horizon, right? Whereas leverage funds, hedge funds are looking at maybe just speculating and getting in on, you know, on, on shorter term timeframes. And so what you have is even within an auction, right, where you have, um, you know, a high, uh, an expensive area and a, and a bargain area, high and low, you can also have auctions within those, um, within, within auctions, right? You have smaller auctions sometimes. You can see price do something like this, right? Maybe something like that. And then you get maybe something like that, and you might get something like that, and then you might get something like that, right? Where it might not make sense at the moment, but let's say, for example, you know, we have an auction, and then we might have something like this happen. Yeah. And again, we're going to go over a chart, and maybe something like that. And then you have a smaller period. And this whole large, you know, auction might actually be over the space of a year, right? As far as the, the, the bigger fair value auction. And within that year, you have situations like this. Now, to the, uh, to the uninformed trader, yeah, it might look like, for example, this move here is a trending move, right? The market is trending down, but in fact, you'll find many times uh, is that with, even within a trend, you'll have, um, you know, uh, an auction. You have many auctions, uh, you know, take place. All right, and you'll see something like this probably. Oh, sorry, I'm just getting a bit tired of doing this. But you, you get the point, right? You get the point. These are what you will see, right? So because these periods here, which that might be, for example, a couple of weeks, that might be maybe a month or two, that might be another maybe couple of weeks, that might be a couple of days, that might be, for example, a couple of hours, etc., etc. right? 
different businesses are doing different business. Uh, sorry, different businesses are doing uh, uh, are, are doing business. Sorry, let me get my words out. Um, uh, for different reasons and motivations, but ultimately, what we want to do is choose to do business where we can see objectively from a higher time frame where the you know the big business are doing a business that's really in the banks that's really what we're attempting to do is trying to maybe filter out the lower time frame filters and of course you can trade these lower uh you know time frame auctions right if you choose to but um just understand where you are in the bigger auction in the bigger time frame of auctions right so actually in fact let's this would be a good time to actually look and give an example uh maybe on the dollar index or something like that something a bit more neutral um exactly what i am uh talking about right so here we are on the dollar index right and we've gone back all the way to the data which is basically goes back to like 1986 right and what you're going to see is you're going to see an auction right and this is really kind of an extreme view, but this should really get the point across, right? The dollar has been in a massive auction. This is a monthly chart. You know, the high, if you consider since 19, uh, since April 1986 or May, is it April year 1986? Since from here to March, the uh, 3rd of March, 2008 the dollar has auctioned between the one two ones and the 70 cents you're thinking to yourself whoa okay oh well that's uh that's a massive that's a massive auction right but even within this auction yeah even within this uh, multi-decade auction what you will have and what you will find is that you will have periods where remember each candle represents a month yeah this is what you have to be aware of Right. Each candle represents a month. So within for about four months, prices were auctioning between that price and that price. For another maybe four months, five months, prices were auctioning between that price and there. Prices were auctioning between there and there. Yeah. Prices were auctioning between there and there. Prices auctioned between there and there. And you had another auction between there and there. Yeah, we can go through it fact you'll see is that you get even larger auctions right you get longer term auctions multi-decade auctions within those auctions right between there and there yeah see month monthly auctions you see one right there yeah you see some right there you can see probably one around there and even within that auction you can see something there if you drag prices across of course you know you start to see more and more and more auctions that could go on and on and on yeah but you're getting hopefully you're getting the actual point of this yeah is that prices can auction within auctions yeah and we can go down to for example you know the last five years right where you'll start to see, um, you know, this being the uh, being the auction right here, yeah, there, right. That was like 2015 to 2022. We were in that auction, and now we're in that auction, that large fair value auction. You had a period where prices were auctioning between there and there, right? There and there, yeah, there and there. Yeah, the weeks. Remember, this is this this is a weekly chart. So each candle represents a week. Get an auction between there and there. You can see even between there and there. We get that as well. Yeah, and even again when prices kind of broke out, weekly ones there. You got some there. Yeah, and prices do trend within auctions. Yeah, so somebody might look at that as being you know a trend. Yeah, and they're not wrong. <laughs> You're definitely not wrong about you know trending markets but if you're thinking about this in terms of of it being an auction and even when prices recently over the past you know year or so uh, made this uh, you know new high for example it was still in the context of where are we in the actual auction of 
where the dollar is, right? What is expensive, right? At one point, this was seen as expensive. and one point, this was seen as bargain price. And value does change depending on, obviously, the fundamentals. But this is a great example, a really good example of, uh, you know, what you're seeing in terms of, um, you know, auctions within, within um, or trade trends within auctions, right? And you can go down to the daily, get a bit more uh, fractal, a bit more granular, right? You can start to see auctions. Oh, sorry, wrong, uh, wrong uh, indicator on tool, right? You can start to see even on a daily time frame chart. We went up to the weekly, now we're seeing on a daily. Within this trend, you can start to see the auctions take place, right? And remember, each candle is a day, right? So you can start to see prices were auctioning between here and here. Auctioning, as we're trending, prices are auctioning, right? Prices auction between there and there. And then auction right here within that one there. So you can start to see where the auctions are within the trend. Yeah, and we can go on and on and on and on. All right. And again, we can go down to maybe the uh, the four hour time frame. And within those daily auctions, you'll see more auctions. Yeah. And that's just again how it goes, right? It's 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 um you know, businesses doing business, and some businesses will be doing business, and some some won't, right? Some businesses, not all businesses, are and banks are interested in doing business here, right? Whereas a lot of them are obviously interested in doing business further down here or up here, right? But it's our job as um, as as traders is to try to trade around obvious auction highs and obvious auction lows and obviously the lower you get um uh the uh, the more difficult it obviously becomes right to to spot certain auctions which is the reason why ultimately you should or i can't tell you what to do i can tell you what i do i always look at the daily as an anchor right and look at where the institutions are you know auctioning between right and even when you look at the size of certain auctions can look at that as being a looks like about a 500 uh, pip auction you can see there is a is a 300 pip auction that auction there is about a 400 pip auction you know on the daily we've got you know another 400 or so pip auction so you can see these auctions on the daily time frame charts right to be around that 200 sometimes they're a bit lower right depending again on volatility um, but you can start to see where they are and even when you get you know this auction here right auctions within auctions until it breaks out so that auction there is again where we are right and that's another 500 pip auction so going back to the uh, uh, the presentation so you know looking at trends within large fair value auctions um, you know, you have small fair value auctions within big fair value auctions. Not every single bank is going to do business at every single level. Some businesses will stay out. Some businesses will get in. It's an auction at the end of the day. You don't have to be involved in every single auction, right? But that's funny enough what what uh, traders are attempting to do when they switch, you know, time frames and are going from five minute time frames to daily time frames, etc., etc. Right? So it's um it's you know it, it's really kind of just understanding where to do business and ultimately trading supply and demand zones right or support and resistance levels or i say and support and resistance levels because you still want to combine it's not either or you know I, I trade both and use both right are really an attempt to trade fair value auctions whether you realize it or not that's exactly what you've been doing but unbeknownst to you <laughs> right you've um you've you've the, the narrative really has been just trade it support or resistance and looking at it from a pattern trading perspective and ultimately what you're actually doing is actually trading uh highs and lows of potential auctions so let me just i guess uh, draw this out right so 
we know typically, yeah, this is what we see from a support and resistance uh, perspective, right? Where resistance becomes potential support here. Now, if prices do something like this, what does that actually become? Or what does that look to become? Another auction, right? This is an auction where at the moment buyers are considering that to be a bargain, sellers or buyers are looking at that to be expensive and then you might get something like this, right? And even if prices break down and then go higher, what is this? That is gonna be the next auction where buyers have agreed, yeah, that that, looking back, that was uh, an area that made a new high. So this would be more of a demand zone, yeah? This would be more support and resistance. So that'd be resistance there and that would be support, yeah? This is an area that led to a new high. This was a previous expensive area, maybe from a previous you know, auction, yeah? Prices broke above that new auction which was considered expensive in the past, yeah? And so, when prices come back to this area which made a new high, right? There was so much buying here you know, even when it reached the previous expensive area, it was still seen as a buying opportunity. So this is the strongest place to look to do business, right? Or the, the, the most obvious place to do business because if prices come back down here, then look to the left, that made a new high. So we see prices, hopefully, depending on, you know, obviously the fundamentals and resentment, you know, do the same thing here, right? Whereas support and resistance traders, you know, maybe looking at, you know, that area thinking that that might be the auction. And of course it happens, right? Not to say that that doesn't happen, it happens all the time. But ultimately, regardless of whether you're trading supply, demand, support, resistance, or a combination of both, what you're actually doing, yeah? And I hope this is, you know, this is a light bulb moment for you, is actually attempting to trade at areas where it is cheap or expensive, yeah? You're trading within auctions. Yeah, yeah. just let that sink in, let that sink in. Anyways, so um, a bit of a caveat to this, I say a caveat, but a bit of a, um, uh, I guess a side note to this matter of fact is, is, and I have to kind of mention this, is basically as well, depending on, you know, whether you're swing trading or whether you're intraday trading, um, especially this is more towards those who do more, a bit more swing trading, um, uh, you know, it's really important to notice and is that the number of trades you take does not equate to the amount of profit or loss that you will make, right? In, in this context, profit. A lot of traders think that, well, the more opportunity you have to make money, the more money you will make. That is not true. Um, because you can have a trader that can take, you know, 10 trades a year, 12 trades a year, maybe once a month and be profitable, whereas you could have a trader who might take 100 trades or 1,000 trades in a year and break even, yeah? There's no correlation to the number of trades that you take equating to the amount of profit that you will make. So don't feel that you have to take, you know, you have to go down to these lower time frames, look for these lower time frame auctions, um, uh, and and feel that you have to take you know ten trades a day. It's not it's not necessary. It really isn't. You know, um, you know the, the the brokers will convince you to, uh, to to take as many trades as possible because they make money off the spread, right? That's you know that's it's, it's their job, and so um, you know uh, the job of a trader really is just to trade profitably, follow the process, um, and however that process um, you know whatever that process is. Right? Whether you trade you know, once a month, whether you trade for once a week, whether you trade twice a week, twice a month, it doesn't matter as long as you follow the process and you understand, obviously, good risk reward, risk management, etc. and all of that. That is really what is key. And also, as well, to wrap this up, that you're trading and attempting to trade at uh, you know, highs and lows or expensive or, or, or cheap areas or bargain areas, really. Of auctions right and so you can go out there now into the wilderness and uh, you know armed with this new knowledge uh, do a bit of back testing of course as you should do 
and uh, hopefully you know your eyes have really been opened to uh, this way of looking at the market if not then um, you know maybe you'll go back to the matrix in it right but um you know if you really want to make the most of uh trading around auctions right one of the things i would definitely suggest or two things i would suggest is either um you know get some mentoring some fundamental risk sentiment analysis mentoring because ultimately it trading with auctions and trading alongside banks goes hand in hand with understanding fundamental and risk sentiment analysis and if you don't understand it on a really high level um you know with me at trading180.com yes you can trade like this but ultimately you won't really understand um to a high degree why certain areas you shouldn't be trading and why certain areas maybe you should look towards right it just becomes another technical um and i wouldn't even call this a strategy right it just becomes another technical um uh i guess string to your bow yeah uh but you won't fully again interact with how the market is supposed to be fully interacted with and the second uh you know uh thing i would say is the only other person that i know right who you will get the most out of this type of uh, of uh, this this concept is with mark chapman at the uh, underground traders alliance um, and Mark really, um, you know, uh, teaches the, the business model of market makers. And it's not um, anything that you've seen online. You know, he's actually, um, you know, an actual market maker has showed him the business model. Right. So and his group are doing very well. Uh, you know, my group are doing very well, um, you know, combining uh, both, um, you know, approaches and, uh, yeah. So if you really want to take full advantage of, um, you know, your understanding of this video, please, 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 you know, reach out to either myself or, you know, contact Mark and, um, we will show you how to really take advantage of the information that you've just learned. If not, um, I do sincerely wish you all the best and, um, you know, let me know how your results are going and, uh, whether this has really helped, maybe, you know, uh, spark some sort of uh, uh, light in your in your head to say ah oh, I know it that's it brilliant that's that's what's been going on or whether you think actually in fact this is absolute nonsense right this could be absolute BS right you're like nah 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 Neil's talking absolute nonsense well uh, I'd like I still like to hear it anyway and your reasons why but guys take care I hope you found this useful and uh, speak to you soon all the best.